I want to begin with addressing several comments I received in the comment section on the post-trib video I did last week. This is um, going to be, I guess, part of a series here. And I believe that I've been called to bring this forth. I want to address one comment in particular that was left several different times by several different people. The comment is God would not allow his bride to suffer. Or Jesus would not allow his bride to be abused. Different formats, but saying the same thing. I was reading a scripture this morning in John 21 after Jesus had uh, risen from the dead and appeared to the disciples a third time, and he was dining with them. Jesus asked Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He asked him three times this question. I was speaking with someone last week, and they said, we were talking about, well, he asked him three times if he loved him. The other person said to me, just like Peter denied him three times before he was converted. See, Satan had desired to sift Peter like wheat. But Jesus prayed for him that after he was converted, that he would comfort, edify, feed the sheep, And of course, Peter was converted after Jesus arose from the dead and breathed on him the Holy Ghost. We find that in John 20, verse 22. But Jesus in John 21 goes on to say to Peter for the third time, Do you love me, Peter? Peter says, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him the third time, Feed my sheep. And the next thing we all need to pay attention to very closely. Verse 18, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Jesus spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. I want to tell you a story about a man named John Chow. As a teenager, John Chow sensed God calling him to take the gospel to the people of North Centennial Island. Sentinel Island. This was a boy who was a teenager who knew that God had called him to share the gospel with a part of the world that had not yet received it. Our Bible tells us that that will happen that this gospel will be preached in every nation. For nine years, John prepared himself to go to the island, to live among the people, to learn their language and share Christ with them. And John knew the risks. He knew the people of this island had been violent toward visitors before. But he also knew God had called him to go. One of his quotes is, I believe that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience. And shortly before John's death, he said, I want my life to reflect obedience in Christ and to live in obedience to him. I think that Jesus is worth it. He's worth everything. On November 16, 2018, John went ashore on the Norse Sentinel Island for the last time. 
When the fishermen returned the next day, according to the police report, they saw a dead person being buried at the shore, from which the silhouette of the body and clothing and circumstances appeared to be the body of John Allen Chow. Nothing is known about what happened between John's arrival on the beach and his death. The young man, who would later be ridiculed as the colonizer, had approached the Centennialese without a weapon. Even after being shot at, clearly willing to give up his own life. John's body was never recovered, and he had requested that if he was killed, his body be left on the island. Now, interestingly enough, brethren, following his death, a storm of assaults was unleashed on John and his family. All nations had it, and at times anyone who would dare to think of sharing the gospel with another human being. The fishermen who took John to the island were arrested, as were other Christians who had spoken with John in the islands. Their trial began November 20, 21. The story of John the Adventure Bro quickly turned to John the misguided missionary, the colonizer, the thoughtless disease spreader, the mocking memes on social media and criticism in a variety of media came in waves. Some comedians even used the story of John's murder in their acts. More concerning was the criticism from Christians who attacked John's perceived lack of preparation and sensitivity to the culture. Some even questioned whether the Great Commission might be outdated in 2018. Perhaps they posed it doesn't apply to tribes that have no contact with the outside world. I would say for me, the only ongoing pain that I have about John's mission and death is actually knowing how Christianity as a whole treated John so poorly after he was so willing to give his life for Jesus. He was willing to give his life for a people, a group that he never actually got to meet. I wish, I will call it Christendom, would have been kinder to him. That's a quote from Pam Arland. The article was featured in the Voice of the Martyrs. This month's Voice of the Martyrs, May 2022, features his journal, everything he wrote in his journal from each visit to the island. He admits in his journal that he was scared, frustrated and uncertain, but it's worth me going on foot to meet them. He didn't want to die. He thought it would be wiser to leave and let someone else continue with a big question mark. He said, no, I don't think so. I'm stuck here anyway without a passport and having been off the grid. I still could make it back to the U.S. somehow. It almost seems like certain deaths to stay here. Yet there is evidence change in just two encounters in a single day. There was an evidence change in two of his encounters on one of his visits to the island. He said, I will try again tomorrow. For those two souls that he saw the evidence of a change, glory be to God. And all the people who said all of the hateful and hurtful things, Jesus tells us in John 12, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. I pray that the very scripture I just read to you comes alive. And John Chow's story and his death bear much fruit as a witness to those very Christians who persecuted him and his family even after his death. This is what happened with the apostles and the prophets before them. Many of them died 
all but twelve of the apostles. Excuse me, I misspoke. All twelve of the apostles, except one. Except one. Sacrificed their lives for the advancement of the gospel. Are we going to be inspired now, or have we been, to have that same boldness to share Christ? It upsets me, and I'm not mocking them at all, but it upsets me that there are continual dates set for the rapture. This has happened for hundreds of years now. The first one that I can recall was set in 1844. And it's been going on ever since. And instead of us boldly going and preaching the gospel of Christ to a lost and dying world, we're behind our computers setting rapture dates. Peter wasn't going to be taken in the rapture. Jesus spoke to him about what death he should glorify God. So how is it that people tell me that the brought that Jesus is not going to allow the bride to be abused or be beaten up? Who is Peter? Who was Paul? Who were the prophets before them? Who is Stephen? Who are these people? Are they not part of the Bride of Christ? I ask you this day because people accuse people like me that don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture That the truth is not in me, and because I don't believe that, I'm going to hell. I just, it baffles me. I want my life and my love for you, each and every one of you, to reflect his love for us. If I seek my life in this world, I will lose it. But if I lose my life for his sake, I shall find it. And in talking about the harvest, the harvest of the saints, let's go in the word. Let's look at what the word of God says in Matthew 13. The disciples were asking Jesus to declare unto them the parable of the tares of the field. Jesus replied to him, them. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest, the harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear so i ask you who was peter who was paul who were the prophets who were the apostles that were martyred for the name of jesus christ who was stephen are these people not part of the bride of christ I hear many people say that there's the bride, they'll be taken first, and the rest are just friends or guests of the bride. We cannot count Paul, John the Baptist, 
Stephen. Zebedee's sons that Christ showed them would drink from his cup. They were all martyred for the name of Jesus Christ. So were all the people after that preserved the word of God and risked their lives in smuggling the word from country to country so that you could sit here today with me and go over the scriptures. They died. They have died since the beginning and they die even unto this moment that we speak right now somewhere in the world, someone is being martyred, someone is being imprisoned, someone is being tortured for the name of Jesus Christ. There's another scripture I want to read to you. When people speak of the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, John the Baptist who came before Jesus, and Jesus himself spoke of the wheat harvest. But in putting this in perspective, if anybody was part of a barley harvest, I think that that would be found in Matthew 27, verse 50 through 54, if we were going to put it in this context as a type of harvest. Let us read Matthew 27, beginning in verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints, which slept, arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. 52 and 53, I'm going to read it again, because it's profound. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection. They went into the holy city and appeared unto many. If there was a barley harvest of any sort, in reading of this scripture, I would suppose it were these saints that arose after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as it tells us in his word. John the Baptist, whose voice was crying in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord who came before him to tell of him, who baptized with water, spoke of Jesus who would come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist spoke of this wheat. Let us go to Matthew 3, verse 11 and 12. Matthew 3, Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan, whose winnowing, is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. We find that too in just the scripture that we just read in Matthew 13. At the end of the world, the harvest. And he cast them into the furnace of fire where there was wailing and gnashing of teeth. He gathered out of his kingdom all things that offended and he gathered his, in the scriptures it tells us, into his barn. Luke 3, 16 and 17. John is speaking here. John the Baptist, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, 
and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his gardener. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. John spoke of this wheat. But many say that we are not the wheat, that we are the barley. They don't want to be the wheat. It just seems that they don't want to be the wheat, but John the Baptist and Jesus spoke of the wheat. And Satan has entered the front doors of the churches, and he has sowed tares among the wheat with a doctrine that tells his people that you will not have to suffer. You will not see tribulation. When Jesus himself told us in this life, you will have tribulation. Jesus also said, if you are not willing to follow me, if you are not willing to pick up your cross and follow me, then you are not worthy of me. Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. Read that in the context. Let us, let us go there now. Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. The righteous perish, and no man layeth it to heart. Merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Turn to Revelation 3.10, Church of Philadelphia. Verse 10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Read Isaiah 57, 1 and 2 again and tell me what being kept from or taken away from the evil to come means. What resting in their beds, what Jesus meant by those who rest, those who sleep. We know in the story of Lazarus and another girl where Jesus was saying they are asleep. And the rest of the people around him mocked and snickered because they knew they were dead. The Philadelphia church from the beginning, whose start began after the letters of John the Revelator were written to the churches. There were different cities in what is known now today as modern day Turkey. There was Philadelphia, Laodicea, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis. All of these were cities. All of these cities had pagan worship to other gods. But there were those in the cities who belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ and who worshipped him. They received a letter. Philadelphia, in fact, received a letter and was told that they were going to be kept from the hour of temptation which came upon the world. In Philadelphia, back then in the early church, the Mongolians came and slaughtered those believers in the city of Philadelphia, and they built a wall with their bodies. They received this letter. I think that the scriptures in Isaiah 57, 1 and 2 definitely apply to those people. They were taken away. They rest in their beds each one walking in his uprightness. But no man layeth it to heart that those righteous perish. No man considers it that these merciful men were taken away from the judgment, from the temptation that was to come. When is the judgment? When is the judgment? Let's turn to uh, John chapter 12 and find out when the judgment is. The judgment of this world. John chapter 12 in verse 31, John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus, his hour had come and he was about to be delivered up and crucified at that very moment. But he says this, now is the judgment 
of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Kind of gives you a new perspective on Revelation 12 and the whole book of Revelation and the timing of Revelation and its events. John chapter 12 verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. And then he goes on to say, just before he's delivered up, that the judgment of this world is now, that the prince of this world is cast out now. He spoke of his impending death and resurrection and what that would bring. Many people also speak of this uh, barley harvest, that there are three harvests. I've had several people, friends, and even those who don't uh, uh, attest to being my friend at all. Uh, they speak, and they've written me, emailed me, texted me, um, left comments that they're, they definitely know there's three harvests. Well... John the Baptist spoke of the wheat. Jesus spoke of the wheat before, even before he was about to be crucified. Jesus spoke of the wheat when he was explaining the parable of the tares and the children of righteousness and the children of the wicked one. Wheat. Wheat. But many argue that there is a barley harvest. And they use the book of Ruth to try to convince. Ruth chapter 2, verse 23. So Ruth kept last, kept uh, fast, excuse me. Ruth kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Ruth did not marry Boaz until the end of the wheat harvest. The word tells us. Let's go back to Matthew uh, chapter 13. Verse 24 through 30. The parable he put forth saying the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did thou not sowest good seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then we go and gather them up? But Jesus said, Nay. Lest while you gather the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. The word here in Matthew chapter 13 tells us exactly what these things are. The one that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Are you willing to follow 
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at any cost? Or have you put a limit on what you were willing to suffer? The escape that we find, the found worthy to escape, I believe the Word of God speaks truth and Isaiah 57, 1 and 2 is very pivotal to what we need to understand when we are kept from an hour of trial or evil to come. We will rest in our beds and this corruptible will not inherit in corruption. This mortal cannot put on immortality without dying first. Remember what Jesus said before he died on the cross about a corn of wheat falling to the ground and dying. If it dies, it brings forth much fruit. John Chan, the servant of our Lord and Jesus Christ, who died in the island there. His seed, he was deeply rooted. His corn of wheat died. And those two people that he journaled, that he got through to on that island, they will take his place. They will spread his truth now. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ reached the island. Glory be to God. And it wasn't a man who was sitting around setting rapture dates. He was called by God to go share the gospel to a place that he knew he was at risk of dying, but he was obedient unto the Lord, and he did not count the cost. And I believe that in a sense, he, he was gathered, raptured, gathered into his fathers, and is resting, sleeping in his bed, walking in his uprightness until the harvest at the end of the world. And as the Lord told Daniel, Go thy way, Daniel. At the end of days you shall stand in your lot. And these people will be on that sea of glass because they overcame this world and they love not their lives unto death. And if I don't speak these things to you and this comes for you tomorrow and you're standing there saying, But... They told me we would be raptured before this. Then you will know that they lied. You can't call it anything but that. Whether they were taught in these world-run seminaries, whatever, wherever, they were taught, and whoever taught them, because this goes probably about 400 years back of this doctrine. Some were still speaking the truth when I was a child. I don't hear it anymore. Satan entered the front doors of our churches and so tears among the body, the church, the wheat. I will leave it at that, and I pray that you take everything to the Lord on bended knee before him. Don't take my word for it. Let the word of God speak for itself. And put on the full armor of God now, so that you, having done all, will be able to stand in the day of evil and having done all stand. Having done all stand. Be prepared. Because the Bible says they will kill you thinking they are doing God a service and they have since the beginning and they haven't stopped and they will not stop until the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, blessed be the name of the Lord.